Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by Jennifer Berkshire, who co-wrote, along with Jack Schneider, a great book called A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. So we'll be talking about this book today. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I've re- First of all, thank you for writing the book. It's phenomenal. In my opinion, maybe the best like what's happened to education 101 book that's been written. Uh, I think it's wow. Phenomenal. So wow. thank you. I, I'm going to pass that along to my co-author, Jack. He's going to be, well, it's going to go straight to his head, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to give a short intro and then we'll, we'll just jump straight into it. And I hope we can work chronologically and do so in a concise fashion so we can get it all in. Um, so the book starts by asking a very simple question. How have conservative ideas, I would call them even radical ideas, uh, went from the fringes of society to mainstream policy over the course of the past several decades? That, in fact, the threat we face today is, in fact, fundamentally new and a different threat than it has been in the past. And that right-wing attacks on public education have four main principles. Education is a personal good, not a public one. Schools belong in the domain of the free market, not the government. To the extent that they are able, consumers of education should pay for it themselves, and unions and other forms of collective power are economically insufficient and politically problematic. So you write that supporters of public education will need three kinds of knowledge, and the book is structured in a way to feature these forms of knowledge. First, the dogma that underlies the dismantling agenda. Second, the changes already in motion. And third, possible futures. So let's start with the first section of the book and move in chronological order. You start with private values. Can you talk about the broader ideology surrounding personal freedom that sort of underpins these right-wing attacks on public education? Yeah, you know, we're, we're really used to hearing this kind of language used to talk about all kinds of other institutions. And I think what's different now is that it's like, oh my gosh, right? They, you can't have public education in this worldview either, right? Because it's all, you know, it's all sort of a taking, right? That the the goal is always to reduce the tax burden on the wealthiest citizens, and I think what's really kind of hard to believe that it, you don't have to go back that far in the history of states like Indiana, and and other states in the in the Midwest where the states really grew up around the idea of public education. You know, they made the states great. And so when you contrast that with the kind of legislative shenanigans that are going on in your state right now, and you realize how completely your elected officials are abandoning this idea and ideal, it's, it's a really pretty startling, but at the root of it is that, you know, that, really any any kind of public good is oppressive to those who have to pay for it. And public education is in many ways our most socialist institution, right? That we take, uh, we tax everybody, they have to pay for it. You pay for it whether or not you have kids who attend school. And then we use the structure of public education to try to equalize um, the enormous gaps we have between kids from affluent families and kids from families with very little. And so you can already see that those sorts of principles would be very offensive to people who object to things like taxes, to things like redistribution. And so the the idea of making K-12 education more like higher ed, where you decide how much you want to pay for it and you bear that burden, like that's kind of the direction that they'd like to see us headed. And you provide a really great historical context for this, that in fact, there's sort of two sort of pushbacks. The first, of course, is to the progressive era, New Deal era policies, that there's this pushback to status policies that created reforms for working class people. But then also that Friedman writes his article uh, a year after Brown v. Board of Education. So it's like a response to this redistributive policies of the FDR, New Deal, progressive era, but then also the response to the gains made during the civil rights era. What an astute observation. I'm so impressed at your close reading of the book. So the um, 
I spent a lot of time traveling through the Midwest and I, you know, when I would travel through places like, like uh, Wisconsin, Michigan and Indiana as well, what you've noticed was that so much of the political agenda was basically like backlash politics from the new deal that, that the Midwest is dominated by what, you know, you might even describe them as kind of angry industrialists. So, you know, in the, in the Michigan, in Michigan, it was families like the DeVosses in, in uh, Wisconsin, it was the Bradleys, you know, people who, who sort of believed that in the new deal, the government took too much power away from wealthy elites and, and tilted the balance of power in favor of workers. And they've spent decade upon decade upon decade trying to write what they see as an imbalance. And that's really the story of what happened after the 2010, 2012 elections, right? That suddenly all these states go right to work, right? Like, where did that come from? And then you, you go back to that post Brown v. Board uh, period and Milton Friedman and Another book that I would really, really recommend that people read is Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, which I'm sure you've, you've read already, but there's this really, really creepy scene in there where after Brown v. Board is handed down and the state of Virginia actually closes down its public schools in order not to have to integrate them. And you hear these libertarian economists uh, you know, they they see this as, you know, such an opportunity, right? Like right. here's an opportunity for taxpayers not to have to pay for schooling. And they realize at a certain point that making a race-based argument really isn't going to cut it. And so instead they adopt the language of the market to make their case, right? Like let's give parents the opportunity to vote with their feet and schools will compete. And the, the idea that a vision that was formulated in order to get around integration is now being held out in states like Indiana as the thing that's finally gonna fix what ails our public schools and put kids on a path to opportunity, I find just shocking. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and the role of private school vouchers. So this was a direct response to the desegregation efforts. Race, of, of course, always a factor but that the vouchers didn't work. I found this interesting. And, e and each step of the way, you sort of point this out. It's like they run into a snag. Maybe it's public opinion. Maybe it's a sort of like a uh, bureaucratic process. And then they find a way around this. And in this starts, you start this with this conversation about vouchers not working. So then conservatives shifting their tactics to focus then on charter schools. Can you talk about that? Yes. So my co-author is an education historian. And so this has turned out to be such a nifty kind of person to have handy, right? That like whatever the policy is, he can tell you where it originated and what the thinking was behind it. So I was shocked to find out that, for example, education savings accounts that are being rolled out in Indiana right now is a disruptive innovation. The first time that those uh, were put forward was in the Reagan administration. And, and they met with a resounding thud. That, that people were really pretty horrified by the idea that you would take money out of the public schools. And they asked all the sorts of questions that we really need people to be asking more of right now. And so the Reagan administration had to back away from that idea that it was just politically too unpopular. And so instead, uh, what you get are the idea of charter schools, which are these publicly funded privately managed schools. And you see really kind of like, almost like a treaty between Democrats, centrist Democrats in particular, and the right. And the right agrees to kind of, you know, put to the side one of their big priorities, which is religious education. And the Democrats put to the side one of their big priorities, which was integration. And instead they come together around the idea of free market principles and you know that they'll weaken teachers unions um you know but for the right reasons and schools will get more money but there'll be a lot a uh, lot of new accountability uh strings attached and then i think that where people erred on the democratic side is that they sort of assumed this was this was a permanent arrangement and that the end goal was to just you know have a lot of charter schools that competed for you know things like innovative approaches to innovate to uh schooling and instead, what you see is it's this very slippery slope, as folks in Indiana are discovering at this very moment. 
And I should back up and say you make this point very clearly. And there's also another historian, uh, Kathleen Ballou, who writes about the history of the white power movement in the United States. She's making a very similar point. She's a historian out of the University of Chicago that, in fact, today's right wing movements, uh, the goal is not just to sort of privatize as much as we can or deregulate as much as we can, but that it's like an all out attack on the state apparatus itself that like it's no longer let's reform public education to like maximize private benefit. It's we want to get rid of public education. So that is such an important point. And one of my great frustrations right now is that it's so hard to get people to see that, that anything that you write about education gets a little bit trapped in an education box. But what we argue is that the reason that the right is so fixated on education policy in all of these states, you know, and it's not just Indiana and in 23 states since the 2020 election, Republicans have rolled out these sweeping proposals to dismantle public education and expand private school vouchers. So what we argue is that you know this is not this is not primarily about public schools in and of themselves. It's about you know reducing the tax bear, uh, burden on wealthy taxpayers and it's about sort of a vision of atomization, weakening the ability of people to band together to demand things like a more robust safety net. It's why they're so obsessed with weakening teachers unions who are often the loudest voice for things like a, a social safety net and you know pushing for more school funding etc but it isn't you know it's not primarily about you know like oh here we have a better way to deliver an education product it's really about dismantling the state and what taxpayer funds go towards once and for all yeah. And th and this is, I mean, we see this in almost every sector. I mean, as I was reading this book, I was trying to apply many of the same principles just to other segments of society. And, and it it's almost the same. So you can go from social security to name the sort of institution. You guys make, I think, the really important point that with public education, like if we could commodify this, then we can commodify anything in society. Um, absolutely. So the, the goal is that you would think of yourself as an individual education consumer. And in a lot of these states, the proposal is that some portion of your state tax dollars would just be preloaded on an education debit card. And then you would choose for, from an array of options on a marketplace that would look a lot like Amazon and that, you know, people would rate their options. And that's how you would know if the, the program, you know, for reading was good. If you had any complaints, you could call customer service. But the all those things that the right doesn't like, the school board, the union, the buildings, um, you know, the, the idea that these are institutions that a community rallies around, all that's gone. And I think, you know, it's a it's a disturbing vision, but it's also one that's arriving much more rapidly than I would have predicted. And I think for me, one of the things that's so strange about our current moment is you see people waking up in all kinds of other policy areas to the damage that free market fundamentalism has done. Think about what just happened in Texas. Yep. Um, think about somebody like a Josh Hawley railing against Walmart for the devastation that small, you know, rural, rural American towns have endured at the hands of superstores. But then you come, you get to education and people make the most outrageous free market claim we're just supposed to turn our our brains off and just repeat over and over again that you know that consumers are the best you know that's that's what will really empower people to to get ahead and there's an allure to this because you make this interesting point that i've never heard anyone else make and that is that because of the proximity that each of us have to the profession that there's a lot of people it like leads us to believe that anyone can do this. I've been around teachers. I've been around teachers my whole life. I can do this. That's like, I think really an important point that you guys bring up that I haven't heard too many other people sort of, you know, point out. So I have to give a shout out to, this is one of Jack's favorite um, sociologists. His name is Dan Lordy and that he refers to that as the apprenticeship of observation. And, and it's really true. There's really no other field where you know Americans have the experience of having witnessed it with their own eyes for you know uh, what it you know uh, 
K, K through 12, right? And, and so you hear this kind of shaping the discourse around schools in, in a way that I, I think we, like, we don't often think about. And it, it very much adds to that sense that, that anybody can teach. And if that's the case, you know, why, why do we, you know, why do we need to pay them so much? And at a time where, where populism and a kind of resentment towards elites is a really uh, just, you know, a powerful force. Think about that, you know, like that idea that that teachers can sort of lord it over you or education bureaucrats. You hear a lot of that kind of discourse right now. Yeah. And I, I think that that idea that, you know, teachers, I've seen what they do. I could do that. You could see how that would play right into that. Yeah, and I grew up, I was born in 84, graduated high school in 02. By the time I was graduating high school, there was two things going on. One, all of us had to get a college degree. It was like late 90s, early 2000s. You get a college degree and you punch your ticket. The other thing that I heard all the time from people was like, if you want an easy gig, go get a teaching license. Like you can have summers off, you get all the vacations. And that was like a dominant part of the discourse at that time, I think we might forget. And then of course, teachers turned into the enemy following the 2008 financial collapse. And I thought, my God, now they're the enemy. And then, you know, and because we're in close proximity to Chicago and we've worked with CORE since it first started, the, the C-O-R-E, um, you know, we've watched the CTU rise from a, a, a really sort of moribund union to like this vibrant, amazing political force in the city of Chicago and then West Virginia, Kansas, and so on and so forth. So even in my lifetime, and, and I'm somewhat young, but it's like just seeing how this has changed, you know, the conversation about teachers and, and how we've talked about public education uh, just in my time has been uh, quite significant. Um, it's, it's such a good point. And it, I, I really saw that firsthand traveling through Wisconsin how you know in the uh in after after walker dropped the bomb as they put it how you know teachers were really demonized and that you know one of the problems is that teachers still have benefits that other kinds of workers don't have and so there's you know a, a subject that's ripe for exploitation and then one of the things we learned you know through academic research is that the um that teachers in wisconsin were using their organizational heft not to lobby for teacher related benefits, but for social safety net benefits. And that turns out to have been the real goal all along. Yep. And on the flip side, the success of the Chicago Teachers Union hinges on their ability to fight also for community needs and not just for the sort of, you know, narrow focus of what the teachers need in their workplace. Absolutely. Um, we've been watching that, you know, play out in a really kind of striking form over the last few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I wanted to get to cost cutting because you bring up such an important point here that in fact the increase in spending is largely due to the programs that we provide to special education students and also to black and brown communities but also poor communities as well and that sort of tied up with this is also this gender dynamic that today uh, the majority of teachers are in fact women um, and so we also have this devaluing of work like we do with almost any profession that is dominated by women. So we have that, com like that's a factor playing a role. But then also that dynamic of the cost going up because we're now servicing students and people who otherwise would not be serviced. That's such an important point because the, you know, we joke in the book that you see these kind of phony charts and graphs, like, look how the amount of money just keeps going up. And yet, we're, you know, our global education ranking has never been worse. Um, but the people who make these claims will never acknowledge, you know, just how much more schools are expected to do. And as you hear the sales pitch now for just giving some portion of, of taxpayer dollars directly to parents, um, when you'll hear often the, the tagline is fund students, not systems with no acknowledgement at all that the that such a huge part of the resources that we invest now go to educate kids who would have just been left out of the uh, out of the system in the past and so whenever i hear those claims being made i want to know like well what is the plan um because the one of the real downsides of the kind of voucher approach that's being uh, expanded in indiana is that as a condition 
of leaving the public system, parents sign away their special education rights. And so you can see why this would have tremendous appeal if your view is that we just spend too much money. Um, but the, the fact that there's such an enormous downside that really isn't ever acknowledged is really troubling. And the the key role of this attack on unions. Now, this doesn't take place in a vacuum. Unions have been, you know, people have been going after unions, right wing elements since the New Deal era, but particularly since Patco and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Can you talk about the important force that teachers unions play uh, in our political sphere here that they that and there's no and I think the important point is that there's no separation because we hear this conversation today like there's the teachers union and then there's teachers and it's like no the teachers make up the teachers union but that this attack on unions has been bipartisan uh, to some degree um, and that it's also sort of undermined our ability to have political power in the arena of public education and that's precisely the goal. I've been thinking about this a lot in the context of the school reopening battles, because the like if you just hung out on Twitter all day, you would really you would get the very strong impression that the the majority view now is that people want schools open for business right away. They don't care if teachers are vaccinated and teachers unions are enemy number one. And what we've seen in poll after poll is that that is actually a really that's a very small minority of parents. And that the, for example, a new poll came out yesterday, 80% of black parents want to see teachers vaccinated before schools reopen. But as you, as you go up the income ladder and over towards the Republican side, that, that number really diminishes, right? Like that's where you hear the really strong cry to reopen schools as soon as possible. And so what uh, what I what I'm really worried about is that you have this kind of bipartisan pile on right now against teachers unions as obstructionist. But because Republicans control most of the state houses, the actual policies that are going to come down as a result of that anger are going to be things like we're seeing in West Virginia, where they just made it illegal for teachers to protest, yep. right, that they always have their eye on a bigger prize. And that's, you know, that's been, that's really been the lesson over the last decade that the, uh, the Obama consensus was, you know, that teachers needed to be, teachers unions needed to be reined in for quote unquote, the right reasons, right? That teachers unions stood in the way of implementing common sense reforms that would lead to higher achievement. And, you know, that's why we needed things like um, teacher evaluations that were tied to test scores. That's why we needed states to lift their caps on charter schools. And you can see the right in all these states nodding along and thinking, wow, you know, like, here's our big opportunity. We want to rein in unions because they lobby for a more robust social safety net and because they, uh, they give a lot of money to Democrats, right? And in that game of paper, rock, scissors, there's really the same winner wins every time. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the the insidious nature of these organizations and their the people within them. So DeVos's brother is Eric Prince, who is the former owner of Blackwater. I myself am a Marine Corps veteran who was in Iraq twice. Uh, so, you know, I, I've long been speaking out against private military contractors and the role they played. And then the money making bonanza that we saw when we got to Iraq, which was disgusting, you know, when you're there and seeing these things. But then, I, you know, one of the protégés of Arne Duncan actually ended up the school superintendent of Michigan City, Indiana. So a woman by the name of Barbara Eason Watkins, who used to work under Arne Duncan in Chicago, bought a vacation home in Michigan City, Indiana, ends up the head of the, she's now the school superintendent of Michigan City Schools. Back in 2015, they privatized all of the maintenance and service department in the school. They also privatized the food services. And the company that was contracted to do it, I'm sure you're aware, uh, Sedexo, uh, who's a company that also had contracts to do laundry when we were in Iraq. So to make, like, just to draw some of these, like, you know, the lines between these entities and, and how they have their hands, like, sort of octopuses everywhere. Um, yeah, it's, it's anyway, that's not even a question. It's just sort of a, I just wanted to reflect on the fact that all of this, I think, is tied together. And it's important to talk about it that way as well. 
I think that that is such an important observation. And it gets back to that frustration I was ex expressing earlier that we insist on seeing these kind of education issues as though they're in some kind of a bubble. So I bet when you start talking about the superintendent and the privatization of school services, people's eyes just roll back in their heads, yeah. right? Like, oh, there he goes again with his edu talk. Whereas Eric Prince, they can get a little bit more worked up about. But, you know, but really, it's it's all the same thing. It's always, uh, you know, pulling at threads, weakening the underpinnings of democratic oversight, right? Like making it easier for uh, for shareholders to extract value. And then for the case of those workers who used to uh, used to have decent quality jobs in Michigan City, yep. right? Those are now minimum wage jobs. Yep. And though they're, you know, the expectation of what they can uh, demand and expect from their employer has just been incredibly reduced, even as though I bet I bet that um, superintendent spends a lot of time talking about, you know, how we need to have high expectations, but not for those workers, apparently. That's right. That's right. And it's I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole because it'll be <laughs> too specific to our locality. But these are also people who are connected with the Redevelopment Commission, the Chamber of Commerce. I could go on and on with the like myriad of connections that and networks that these people operate within from school superintendent to developers and, and all the rest. This, the Neo Voucher program to me sounded, and I come from, uh, you know, a background of people who, uh, to, for better or worse, had been involved in things like this. So for me, when I read about the Neo Voucher program, I was like, this sounds like a money-making scheme that we would have heard of on the South side of Chicago uh, for people who are connected to the outfit or something like I, when I read about this, I was like, so wait a minute. So if you could just kind of explain what they are, because the way that I read this was that, of course, there's no oversight, there's no regulation. Um, but that it's, you're allowed to like move money from the federal government to nonprofit institutions that are then allowed to move that money to private entities. Is that essentially how this functions? That is essentially how it functions. And the, we have to focus on the why. A lot of our state constitutions include language that very explicitly prohibits tax payer dollars going to fund sectarian education, right? And so that's why, uh, so our taxpayer dollars can't go to pay for Catholic schools, for example, right? This, these are called Blaine Amendments. They date back to the last century. And this has been a source of great frustration to all kinds of people, right? It was it was a bipartisan cause um, in the mid 20th century and has long been a conservative crusade, right? They'd like to see taxpayer money go to pay for religious schooling. They feel like kids would be more, they would grow up to be morally sound and, and more ardently in favor of capitalism if they got this kind of morals heavy education, right? So they've always wanted this. And so the issue was, if the constitution says you can't do it, well, maybe there's another way, maybe there's a workaround. And so these so-called neo vouchers um, are that creative workaround. The original voucher idea was just that the, you give the money to the parent and the parent would take it to the, the private school of their choice. But this creates a whole nother level of intermediaries. Um, a lot of states have these call them scholarship granting organizations. And where the sort of chicanery comes in is that the way that state tax codes work, individuals who have a lot of money or businesses in a lot of cases can get hefty tax rebates for making these donations. And so they, you know, they're, they're peddled as kind of a win-win, um, but in states where these programs have really ballooned, right? Like those those uh, tax credits, that's all taken out of your general fund. Um, so I think people would be quite surprised to learn just how many states have these programs. And while they've taken flight in states that are known for get rich schemes, my favorite would be Florida, of course, you know, the one of the more recent ones to, to join this list is Illinois, yeah. right, that yeah. that Illinois has a, a now quite significant neo voucher program that was, uh, it was a partnership between the conservative governor, Bruce Rauner, and the Catholic archdiocese. Yeah. And, you know, first thing you learn is that the kids who ended up taking advantage 
of those scholarships were not from Chicago, not from low income neighborhoods. They were kids from Rockford who already went to private school. Right. Do you, when you're thinking of these characters on the right who are doing this, do you break them into different categories? Because it would seem to me, and this is getting a little off, I want to stick with what's exactly in the book, but I'm wondering, it seems to me that there's people out there who are simply interested in this as like a money-making scheme or it's like, look, I see this as like, can I pump some money into this, put some capital here, make some money here, whatever. And then like the true believers. And it seems like DeVos and them and, and some of those with like more of the religious tint are like true ideological believers in this, that this isn't like, because sometimes we hear our friends on the left, they'll say like, ah, yeah, these people are just making money off of this or whatever. And it's like, that's some of them, but it seems to me that there's two different categories here. So you, you are so right. And that's been another one of my great frustrations that that's kind of the only lens that critics of privatization bring to this, that they assume that, you know, like DeVos just wants to make money yep. um, or the, you know, the, the, the Coke network is primarily interested in, in, uh, in enriching itself the way that it you know has been so successful with with everything else uh, but you're you're right there are actually there were more than two categories um so i would i would divide i would divide them into the sort of pure grifting category and those those would be the people who really are into this to sell things um they're into that's where you often find the ed tech world and there's a nice overlap between conservative visionaries and silicon valley disruptors. Um, then you have the, the people who really believe that kids would be better off out of the system for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, they took flight during the Reagan years, right? That that was that was a really uh, like a powerful crusade. And then a third group, um, I would put the kind of Coke view in its own category. And these are the old industrialists I was talking about earlier, who feel like the schools are are doing an insufficient job of growing young American capitalists. And so um, uh, Charles Koch has a new book. I've got it right here. I really recommend it, Believe in People. And he has this vision that, you know, like take kids out of the schools, let parents educate them as they see fit. Let parents customize their kids' education. And the end result will be what he calls this flowering of social entrepreneurs. And so, and that's, there's some overlap with the DeVos vision there, but then she's also got overlap with the religious right, folks. Right. Right. And, and so now to add in an, an element of, of sort of grossness, I think all through woven through all of those are money-making op, uh, opportunities. So for example, when DeVos was being confirmed as secretary of education, one of the controversies that emerged was that she was a big investor in a company called NeuroCore. And it, it was, you know, there was no science behind it. And they preyed on parents of kids with autism, ADHD. And the idea was that you could come into one of these brain retraining centers. So you will often find woven through these various ideological camps, opportunities for money making. And the more that happens at the state level to roll back regulation, the more that money making vision has an opportunity to really just just go for broke. And you point out in the book that it's a myth that the federal government is largely uh, responsible for the funding of these schools. I mean, I don't know what the percent it was like 47 or 48 percent in the book that it was like st it's states and localities where the where Absolutely. the real money is. Absolutely. And that's why and I don't I don't know what the breakdown is like in Indiana. Um, some in some states, the state plays the predominant role. Um, some states have you know taken measures to try to equalize the disparity across communities. But the the uh, comparatively speaking, the federal government's role is really small. And that's why you'll hear when they're talking about what the federal government can actually do, the focus is overwhelmingly on things like Title I which is the program that, that provides additional resources to schools serving low-income students. Can you talk about this pursuit of profit? How conservatives made schools profitable? It started with the private management of public schools, but that that lost its appeal, and then the strategy shifted once again, and then you end that chapter with a conversation about the University of Phoenix. Or yeah, Phoenix so, Universe. I'm sorry, I forget what, what it is. 
so the you know the dream has long been you know that there's got to be a way to get profit out of those schools and then what you saw back in you know in sort of the in the 80s and 90s when you saw schools being run by private providers and the really the first big push to privatize schools was how frustrated the people who ran them were at you know like it, it's really hard to do education well on the cheap so you can do it on the cheap, but you can't really also uh, make good on your promise that you're going to deliver better results. And so ironically, Chris Whittle, who was the kind of visionary behind this, he abandoned uh, the public education sector entirely. And he now is in sort of the highest, the most expensive form of private education, right? Um, these would be, he sets up schools around the world for global elites, because that's where the money is, where you can charge people um, basically an unlimited amount if you're you know able to sell them on the idea that this going to this magic school is going to set them up for life right but for um for real profiteers the that profit has been elusive and that's why you see them being drawn to virtual education the um, virtual education has turned out to be an enormous cash cow um, including in in Indiana, right, where your virtual schools have been a source of great controversy. One of the really ironic things about our current moment is that people have had an opportunity to see what virtual schooling looks like, and they really do not like it. Yeah. And so the um, it's going to be curious. It's going to be very interesting to see how the proponents of this approach who see it as a cash cow, how do they rebound? Um, I, I happened to notice on um, Alex's website recently, that's the American Legislative Exchange Commission, that they're really, they really want to make sure that people get that the remote learning that they've had such a terrible experience with over the past year, that that is not the same as virtual, like the kinds of virtual schools that they want to keep peddling. And that you have, I, that it seems so clear to Every parent I know, I'm not a parent, but every parent that I know uh, has been up in arms over this. I mean, they, they've, it, on top of, of course, the people who are friends with teachers, who then their friends they see who also have children, who they're trying to teach their kids in one side of their living room, while on the other side of the living room they're sitting at their desk with 30 kids on a, on a screen. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I think it's people have seen it, you know. And, and it's, it's really like you, if you listen closely to the conversation, the sort of post pandemic conversation that's taking shape now, you can really feel people, you know, they like, they see the cost cutting potential of this technology, but the problem is that people really hate it. So I saw one of the candidates for mayor of New York City being interviewed today, and he wants to propose year round school. Somebody asked him, well, how are you going to pay for it? And he said, well, if we have 300 or 400 kids in a remote class, that's not going to be a big deal at all. Right, right. Now, the there was a point I wanted to make I, I almost forgot, because when you said that, I'm thinking to myself, my God, like the, to push this at a time when, again, if poll after poll shows that most working class ordinary Americans do not want this. They want their kids back in school, but they want them back in school safely. We just interviewed uh, Marissa Glidden, who's a union president out in Richmond, California, and she told us the same thing. In her school district, it's overwhelmingly upper middle class white parents who want the kids back. And all of the uh, black, Latino, and other parents in the community, uh, also poor white people in her school district who are like, we, we don't want this. So there's, there's like clear divides here. Um, the last four chapters of this book read like an episode of Black Mirror. I don't know if you've ever seen that show on Netflix, but it's like a... It's too scary for me. It is like a dystopian future uh, TV show, futuristic TV show. And I'll tell you what, these last four episodes when I read them, I was like, this looks like something out of Black Mirror. Now, I don't think any of it is sci-fi at all. Like, it's happening, you document it, and we've seen it in real time. But let's start with... Um, Let's start with reviews, which, you know, it sort of like kicks off this section of the book that like gets me angry as I'm reading it. Because even we have a community center here. So we have like our political opponents will like sometimes leave us poor reviews on our Facebook page or on our Google. And they'll be like, you socialist scumbags, like get out of Indiana or whatever. And I'm like, you know, but so reviews and, and they drive me nuts. And I also used to work in a restaurant industry. So reviews are just horrific. But anyway, 
when did teachers and education uh, institutions start facing the wrath of angry reviewers? Can you sort of talk about how this started? Well, first, the you know our thinking behind those last four chapters is we really just wanted to lay out for people what would it look like if we really did embrace this vision of you know of of education consumers, right? That education is just another consumer good that you purchase, like you would purchase a pair of shoes, a car, or a pizza. And when you think about the way that review culture has really taken hold here, right? That like we give the example of the smiley face that you're supposed to press that button as you leave the, the airport bathroom now, right? There's there's never, there's no exchange where where you know you're not supposed to weigh in on on how you felt about it. And the, you know, that that more and more applies to schools in particular. And where you see it with individual teachers is more at the higher ed. Yeah. Um, you know, rate my professor. Yeah. The the K at the K-12 level, that has not taken hold to the same extent. But the rating of schools through uh, through sites like great schools or increasingly real estate sites, that that is now uh, fundamental to how people choose schools. This happens to be one of my co-author Jack's obsessions that he uh, you know he writes about this and opines about this regularly. That because what happens is that you know in a state like Massachusetts the it it reconfirms people's sense that the only good schools are in places where it's too expensive to live and so you send people crowding into those neighborhoods well you know for example his daughter's school uh across the street in the urban neighbor area of somerville you know shows up with a poor rating and there's you know n according to the map the school ratings map there are no good schools for miles right because they're almost entirely based on things like test scores. So it's amazing how quickly that view has come to shape what we, how we understand what a good school is and how it ends up exacerbating all these other inequities. And it, I mean, on a side note too, it also turns us into very petty people. I mean, in other words, like just on a very human, like subjective social level, even well, socially, collectively, but even subjectively, like, there's times, of course, when you like leave somewhere and you're in a bad mood and you're like, is the first thing you need to do is like write a review? You know what I mean? Like just I, I just the whole like yeah. atmosphere around it and the social atmosphere that it creates to have like people picking everything apart. Did this server serve me correctly? Was the person at Starbucks really nice to me today? And if not, can I leave something poor on their review board? Uber drivers who you point out, we had Stephen Hill on the program and he covers all of these gig workers and he's just like, it's horrific for them. Like they're just like under this constant stress of like, is the last person I drove to the airport going to ruin my job? I mean, this is horrific. And, and I mean, I think that the larger point that's really important here is that the overarching goal is to make your connection to public education just as crappy as it is to your cable provider or your health insurance provider, right? That like, to take away the the structures of democratic oversight, um, so you know we don't need school boards, we don't need to elect people, um, we don't need you know uh, teachers unions are the largest organized force that advocates for public education. Let's get rid of them too. Instead, if you have a poor experience, you'll have a few options. One is that you can vote with your feet by going to another school and purchasing another education option, and your to the extent that you have any ability to express your opinion or make a demand, it's through something like a review, right? Like what uh, what a narrow kind of desiccated vision of, uh, you know, really among the most important institutions that we have. Yeah, yeah, and, and symbolic of the, the bigger debate taking place in the United States, like that democracy is best done through the, you know, marketplace and that your individual consumer choices is how you can really express your democratic urges in this society. Very dangerous stuff. My friend Derek says, we went from being human beings to citizens to being consumers. And he's like, and we need to at least go back to being citizens. <laughs> yeah. And to me, it's just I, like it's I'm just kind of struck you know, again and again by how people seem to be waking up to this in other spheres, but not in education where there's this real doubling down on on, you know, a vision that really like if you subject any of these claims about 
competition or funding students, not systems to any kind of scrutiny, they collapse. Yeah. And you, you point that out. I mean, we didn't do, I didn't do as good of a job as of pulling that out of you in this interview, but for people who will read the book in each chapter, you're, you're both very clear that like, here's what they've tried. Here's how it hasn't worked. And here's how the public has responded to it. And more often than not, the public's been like, Hey, wait a minute. Once they, once people get a hint of this, which also pushes back against this like regressive idea that, oh, everybody's ignorant in America. Nobody knows anything. It's like, no, like when people are given the proper information about these things or when they experience them, they do have the response that people like you and I would want to see, which is like a pushback against this stuff. That's such an important lesson about what happened in 2018 with the great teacher revolt, right? That not in, in those in all those states, you know, the teachers didn't walk out alone. They were, you know, they were joined by armies of, of parents who had seen for themselves, you know, what it looked like when their elected officials, you know, cut public education to the bone. It turned out to be deeply, deeply unpopular. And it's also why you see uh, uh, GOP lawmakers in particular really using this legislative session to try to go after unions. Let's talk about advertising. You use Indiana in the intro of this chapter about selling schools. There's also this connection uh, between the methods that are used in selling schools, the advertising, um, and they also the same methods that like pharmaceutical companies use, but that pharmaceutical companies are in fact under greater regulation than the people who are selling us schools. Isn't that funny? Will you describe for people who don't know what we're talking about, what those billboards in Indiana are like? Wow. Well, the one actually what I thought when I read that, what was interesting is I didn't think so much about the private school boards or billboards that we see advertising private schools. What your chapter made me think about were the number of public institutions who now have billboards as a response to the private entities so they can at least maintain the kind of numbers they need to keep the funding going so we could even have public institutions. That to me was the sort of the point in that book that I pulled out the most was like, that's why we see Purdue Northwest with billboards all over the place where we had never seen them until the last like seven, eight years since really 2010 and that push, that big push of right wing legislation that that passed all kinds of state houses. So, I mean, they're all we, over the place, like come here. And then we also have this race to the bottom. It, it's very similar to the race to the bottom between Illinois and Indiana and all of these states in the Midwest. So we also have a ton of billboards in Indiana that are like, if you don't want to pay taxes, come to Indiana. If you like guns, come to Indiana. If it's like all of this race to the bottom, if you don't like environmental yeah. regulation, come to Indiana. Well, we don't have that either. So it's like right in line with all of those things, you know. What what a bleak, what a bleak description of the land of the Hoosiers. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, we're up here and we've been uh, enduring it in a heavy way for many years. And that's why when I read your book, there's like points in the book where you go, some people think this is too radical. I read the book and was like, this describes exactly what we've been seeing for yeah. years now. You know? Yeah. And, and the, your, you know, your description of the advertising is so spot on that, you know, people, I don't think that people really realize that, that, you know, like, oh, what's wrong with putting up with my kid's school, um, shelling out to, to put up yard signs, right? what's what's wrong with that? And or you'll often hear people in communities where the public schools are really under attack saying, our schools have to do a better job of advertising themselves. You know, we need to get out there, you know, like the, we need to, we need to have the billboards too. And the, you know, the issue is, you know, it's very much this idea that, that schools are consumer driven goods that compete against each other. But it's also, you know, the problem is that when budgets are lean, and I've seen the latest Indiana budget proposals, right? Like they're much more interested in expanding the voucher program. So public schools are going to lose out again. So if you're having to spend money on marketing, where's the money coming from? And especially if you're in an area where uh, the school choice dynamic is intense, like in Indianapolis or, um, or uh, Gary, some of the other yeah. larger communities in Indiana, it means that the kids who are paying the biggest price are the kids who already have the most intense needs, right? But their schools have to advertise intensely or they risk being eaten, right? right? Like what a, uh, what a bleak vision. And that the point you made about there, there not being any regulation 
with with advertising it's totally true you can make all kinds of claims and they're you know they're not subjected to there's no agency that oversees the claims and so that's why uh the virtual academies in particular are known for uh for the sort of the size of the claims they make relative to what they actually deliver and of course the names as you point out in the book like it's an academy or like an institute of technology or whatever it is but they use these like clever marketing schemes and you you sort of open the book with this as well, which is like the very idea of a private school is like enticing for a lot of people. Cause it, so there's a lot of this like psychological factors at play as well with like wrapped up in this propaganda with like trying to brand these institutions as something that's exclusive, which in the world of marketing and advertising makes it a, you know, like, Oh, this product, like this is something we might want. It's exclusive. Only so many people can access it, makes it more attractive for people. No, I think you're absolutely right. And then the, even the name public becomes a detriment. And if that's not enough of a detriment, turn it into government school. Yep. That's oh, such a such a great point. Okay. So chapter 11, because we're about to finish up here, deals with how the right has sort of, the way to turn teachers into gig workers has been to directly attack the licensing process. So like, how do we decertify, how do we make, how do we deprofessionalize the teaching profession? So this, again, is a very old vision that it frustrates conservatives immensely that that teaching is so is so uh, heavily regulated. So you will often hear people say something like, you know, Bill Gates wouldn't be able to teach in our schools because of all the red tape. (laughs) But the goal really isn't to get Bill Gates into the school. It's to get anybody off the street into the school or not even into the school. Right. The dream is the vision of the future is um, what I think of, it's called a for-profit micro school. We didn't include this in the book because we didn't know about it yet, but these are really taking flight during the pandemic. And of course they come from where else? Arizona. And the idea is that anybody can have a little school and that you would you know, use your house the way that an Uber driver uses his or her car. And that you would, you know, like uh, you get six or 10 kids, you're paid per head, there are no benefits. Your pay taps out at $26,000 a year. The kids are mostly educated online, but anybody can do it. And you're, you know, it's a service that you pro- provide alone. You're an independent contractor. And so you see, you can see how much money is saved, but also you get rid of all those other pesky things that you don't like. You're not having to pay for the facilities. There is no teacher's union to make demands about teaching or anything else for that matter. And so you, you know, it's not just like the gig vision is always part of some other, you know, larger vision. And, and it's not a coincidence that in this pandemic period, you see state after state trying to roll back licensing requirements for teaching, right? Always starts as an emergency. I haven't looked at Indiana. I don't know if there's a uh, law being introduced. There's there. rumblings. There's already rumblings about it, of course. <laughs> Yeah, and they'll they'll refer ominously to the teaching shortage, which they created. Yep, yep. And two important points about that process. One is that by teachers having a license, it actually gives them more bargaining power in the labor market. I think that's a really important point that you bring up. That that in you can expand on that if you want. Well, no, that's I mean, and, and it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, where people have the impression that anybody can teach because they've seen it done for so many years. But, you know, actually, the reality is, reality is that 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 isn't true at all. And especially when you think in terms of what we were talking about, that the the, um, the services like the links that we now go to to try to accommodate special kids with special needs. These are these are really go spend some time in a school and see the kinds of specialized expertise that are required. Um, I worked at we have special ed schools in Massachusetts called collaboratives that are regional. And I worked in one for a year and the amount of expertise that these teachers had and the you know, the idea that that, you know, that somehow we would benefit from having them um, uh, taking away licensure requirements is just crazy. Yeah. And and you make the point that if you want to see how this will play out, look at part time faculty at the university level right now. Absolutely. In fact, look at higher ed period. Right. That they don't don't really mention this, but the vision is to make K-12 more like higher ed. 
So you decide how much you want to pay for it. You assume the amount of debt that like it's all on you. Um, and then your professors uh, hold office hours in their car and drive around from campus to campus and get paid thir uh, $3,500 per course. And work part-time jobs. I mean, we have friends who are teaching courses, trying to mold the minds of young Americans who are entering the workforce and becoming adults while they're also serving uh, drinks or cocktails on the weekend while also <laughs> doing whatever other gig job they're doing. It's, uh, it is very dystopian. Okay, so let's let's wrap up with... Uh, education a la carte, perhaps the most dystopian chapter of the book, in my opinion. Um, but this urge to personalize schools, where does it, I mean, we talked about sort of where it came from, but uh, this concept of unbundling, a term and approach used in the world of corporate management um, to sort of further erode public education, what is unbundling? And then the role of sort of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley in this role of algorithms. Um, so people are familiar with the concept of unbundling in the context of their cable company, right? Yeah. That we're supposed to untether ourselves from our cable boxes and just purchase individual, we're supposed to customize our viewing by purchasing individual streaming platforms. So that's really like, that's the metaphor to think of in terms of the vision for education, that you'll hear people railing against the system. You know, every child is so unique. You know, they're just... The system can't possibly serve them all. Instead, parents who know their kids better than anyone should be able to customize their kids' education by, um, you know, tailoring it to what they need mm -hmm. through, by purchasing um, uh, in education products the way that you would select streaming platforms for your viewing. And it, you know, the the downside seems to me to be too obvious to really need to go into much. The um, uh, Silicon Valley is obviously very uh, enamored of this idea, in part because they love the idea of ed tech, right? That that they're um, so they tend to be they'll go on and on about the factory school and kids being treated like widgets. But then on the other hand, putting forward a vision that relies on algorithms. So there are this is a, a vision that is pretty rife with contradictions. So what do you think? I, I took away many, many things from this book. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for writing it because I think if there was one book I would give to people who would, uh, that could explain what's happened over the last 45 or 50 years to public education, this would be the book. As I told you before the interview started, I've already sent it to all my teaching, at least the link to all of my teaching friends in Indiana, including some in the teachers' unions. What do Too you bad they can't afford to buy it, huh? <laughs> That's, uh, Yeah. Well, I was going to tell people earlier, if you do, if you are going to read the Coke book, please don't buy it. Please lift it from a store or something. <laughs> don't get yourself in too much trouble, but steal it, please. Um, what do you think the liberal, progressive, left political movements, those that don't exist, just concerned citizens, what do we need to be thinking about moving forward? You lay out sort of what the problems are, how we got here and what it could look mm -hmm. like. But what do you, because I'm reading this and I'm also thinking, as I do with any book that explains how the right has done something in this country, I think there are things we could take away from this. We can't uh, replicate their approach to political mm -hmm. reform because we wouldn't want to. But I think there are points that, like, for me, their coherency, where it's, like, very coherent ideological position about, like, here's what we value, here's exactly what we're going to fight for. It seems like our people, the liberals, progressives, leftists, socialists, now democratic socialists, like, we are all over the damn place. And it just seems like that lack of coherency and cohesion in our movements, it, it just seems to be so blatantly clear that it's a problem for us compared to their side, which is like, this is the idea. Let's roll with it. We agree. Let's go. I, I love the way you describe what we have to do. And, you know, I would just add to that, that uh, full throated defense of public education is a public good. Um, the, the way that, you know, people responded to the Texas energy debacle, right? Like waking up to realize that, you know, it's insane that, that something as essential as energy would be, you know, on an unregulated marketplace, right? Um, and the, you know, I have to say that I'm pretty disappointed so far with Biden on this stuff, that on the one hand, you know, they're doing a lot of stuff outside of education that's really positive as far as improving the lives of kids and families. But, you know, that the insisting on standardized testing. So here you have Republicans in every state making the argument that every child is so unique 
that we basically can't have public education, that we're just going to give the money to the parents. We're going to fund students, not system. And all the Biden people can say in response is, we're going to have to test you, right? Like yeah. that, that's, that's, that's terrible. They, I, I want to see, we need the, you know, the, the Democrats, the progressives, the liberals, the left, um, they need a vision for what, for, for what public education is and why it matters. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually most enthusiastic about what I see happening on the left because centrist Democrats have been and still are so instrumental in pushing for charter expansion, including in states like Indiana, and often are more than willing to team up with Republicans, including funding them in order to realize that goal, you're seeing more interesting public education advocacy coming from the left. So for example, I noticed that a number of, of chapters of DSA around the country are starting to you know, really agitate on behalf of public education as a public good. Yeah. And, and because the, you know, they're in places where Democrats spend all their time palling around with Republicans to expand charter schools. That's our experience here, where, as you mentioned, places like Gary, Indiana or Michigan mm -hmm. City, we just elected our first Republican mayor in, for the first time in 48 years. But prior to this last election, so, which is another sign, by the way, of, of this shifting trends in the Rust Belt of voting patterns, um, first time we've had a Republican mayor in 48 years. And we, you know, for years, it's been a difficult uh slog here in, in places like Indiana and in sort of more urban environments, because in those urban environments, Democrats had been in power for many decades. So it's also difficult because people see the Democrats at the local municipal level going downstate, working with Republican governors, working with Republican senators, state senators and legislators who then come back with these plans rolled out as public private partnerships, rolled out right. as bipartisan agreements. And these are all things that when people hear them. I think there's more criticism today. Like people are hearing bipartisanship and they go, let's put the brakes on. We're not quite sure what you mean by bipartisanship. But I think over the years, people have saw that and they go, ah, oh, well, they're going to agree on something. It's better than them not agreeing on anything. But we're starting to see more and more people sort of reject the Democratic brand because they don't see the Democratic Party as an alternative. So in Indiana, Biden did a lot better than, say, most of the down ticket Democrats, where people might have mm -hmm. voted for Biden, but they just said, oh, I'm not voting for any of these local Democrats. This big, I think one of the big things, one of the reasons why we were so supportive of the Bernie Sanders campaign was because to us, even, a, say, an Elizabeth Warren vision, a Warren slash Sanders vision of this country, to me, is like a direct attack on that neoconservative vision, neoliberal vision of no state. Pull the state out of everything. Mm -hmm. The state apparatus is our entity or our enemy. The government as an entity needs to be fought and dismantled. Like if we don't approach that with an equally coherent and robust program that defends public institutions, that defends the government or the state apparatus, not everything it does, knowing it has its own problems. But like to me, if we don't at, at the very least go with like a Warren vision and a little better than that, in my opinion, is maybe like a Sanders vision. But if we can't get something like our movements to back that kind of a vision for the future of the country, I think we're going to be in a really rough spot fighting an entity and movements that have a very coherent vision of where they want to go. I think you're absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better. Well, shoot, we'll just end right there then. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. Like, I mean, I know I've uh, praise the book probably enough in the in this interview, but I really can't tell you. We do a ton of book reviews, Sergio and I, in the community center. As you can tell, we've got a gigantic library here, and I, I just can't tell you how useful this book is going to be for people to, to read. So thank you. Well, thank you. It was really a pleasure to meet you. Same here. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.